are in our second week of a new series called that we are doing on the book of Second Peter, um, or True Peter, whichever way you would prefer to say it. Now, as opposed to really being a book, even though we call it a book of the Bible, it's actually a letter written by a man named Peter. Um, so it was written by Peter in about 67 to 68 AD. And this letter, as opposed to being a letter to a specific church, like many of the letters that we see in the New Testament, it's actually a letter to Christians. It's a letter to people who knew the teaching of Christ, who had received this teaching previously and really called themselves Christians. And Peter was writing this letter to them to encourage them. He wanted to encourage them to grow in their faith. He wanted to encourage them to grow in their holiness. He wanted to encourage them to become more and more like Christ. Now, something that is important to note and interesting is that Peter was near the end of his life and he knew that the end of his life was coming near. And, you know, I think there's this significance when we talk about final words that someone has. You know, when when they're coming near the end of their life, if they know that that's coming, their final words are often very well thought out. And Peter, for him... This is what he wrote. This is, this is what he left behind that he felt was so important for the Christians of the time to know, but actually people for the time to come and Christians to come long after he was gone as well. In a way, this letter is almost a bit preventative. You see, at the time, the, the Christians, the churches, they had a bit of an issue with false teachers. Now, false teachers generally, what they're trying to do is they generally try to either add to the gospel or they take away from it. Okay, so they either say, Jesus is great, but you need this, and they try to add to it, or they say, yeah, that's great, but does that part really matter? You know, so they try to take away from it in some way. And so the Christians at the time, they were having a bit of an issue with these false teachers. And Peter, he wanted to speak into that. He wanted to make sure that after he was gone, that they actually remembered the truth, the truth of the gospel, because Peter understood how important that was for direction in their lives. He didn't want these Christians to be led astray by these false teachers. And so in a way, it was a bit preventative. Peter spoke about who he is. He spoke about who Jesus is, what Jesus has promised, and also what Jesus was going to do. And he kind of speaks a bit into the future in this letter as well. And ultimately, what he is doing is he is teaching them, he is teaching us today, what, over 2,000 years later, he is teaching us how to really live out the things that we know, the things from the word, our faith, how to live that out well in our life, how to live out that truth. One of the things that I love so much about Peter is that he made a lot of mistakes. And, you know, there are a lot of people in the Bible who made a lot of mistakes. But Peter, I feel like he's really up there. He just, he made a lot of mistakes. But yet God used him in such a mighty way. That to the extent that we are learning from him today, all these years later, he used him in such an incredible way. And, you know, I love that because it's, com- it's comforting and encouraging for my own life and for us here today who have also made so many mistakes in life because God still wants to use us and can use us in such a mighty way. Now, I'm pretty sure most people in this room, probably everyone, if not, I'm impressed with you, but has watched a TV show in their life. Okay, so at the start of a TV show, they have this section where it says previously on and then they show you kind of what's been happening to give you context for what's about to happen in the next episode. Well, I have a previously on section to this message and you cannot skip it like you do on most of the, you know, on Netflix and most of the streaming devices. You cannot skip it today. We need a previously on section because the message that I'm going to share with you today and the scripture that we will be looking at really bounces straight off the back of Pastor Ben's message from last week. And so to be able to move forward, we really first need to take a quick look back. Last week, Pastor Ben preached a great message. If you haven't heard it, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to it. Um, But he spoke about a few things and then towards the end of the the message, he spoke a lot about um, these different qualities that Peter mentions in the word. The qualities are virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness and love. And he spoke about these qualities that Peter mentions in this letter and how they are... I suppose, result of a mature Christian as we grow in maturity. They should always be increasing and they really are 
key to living this life well, to seeing good fruit from our lives, to um, seeing that we stay on track and keep a direction towards Jesus and becoming more like him. So we're going to take a really quick look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 8, where Peter talks about these. He says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are all called to grow in maturity, to have a deep, intimate relationship with God and to become increasingly like Jesus. That is something that we are all called to. And Pastor Ben spoke about this knowledge last week. There's the type of knowledge that's more our intellect and then there's the type of knowledge that more is about our heart understanding and knowledge. And if we just have knowledge for intellect's sake, then, and it's not partnered with relationship, it's going to ultimately get us nowhere. We're going to be unfruitful and we're going to be ineffective in, the, in regards to the things that God has called, for us, called us to do and in regards to the plan that God has for our lives. We really need this knowledge this, that's this deep understanding of Jesus that comes with this intimacy with Jesus. If we're only focused on knowledge for information's sake, we will miss the intimacy with Jesus and we will rely on our own intellect about Jesus rather than our intimacy with Jesus. We need that relationship, that intimate relationship relationship that's focused on knowing Jesus more, on having this adoration of God and who he is in our lives. You know, it's interesting to me that as this kind of knowledge increases, we actually start to rely less on our intellect and more on God. And that reliance in our life is so important because if we don't have that, what we can do is start to drift and fall away from God. And that is really where we're heading with the message today. I love that what Peter says here in verse 5, he says, make every effort to supplement your faith. He says, make every effort. That means this isn't just like a let go and let God situation here. It's actually, we need to make every effort. It's up to us to steward this. It's up to us to commit to this relationship and growing in faith and growing in these qualities that Peter talks about, becoming more and more like Jesus. You know, that's something that Pastor Ben can't do for you. Pastor Sarah, she can't do it for you either. Your mum, your dad, they can't. Your spouse, they can't do it for you either. You have to do that for yourself. Yeah, our faith, it has to be growing. It has to be fruitful for us to actually be useful in the plans that God has for us for our lives. Otherwise, if we were to think anything different to this, if we weren't to see that as true, then what has happened is we've become spiritually blind, is what Peter says. And that is really where we pick it up. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. So in verse 9, it says this, For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for you practice these qualities. If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided to you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You can't be effective in ministry if you are spiritually blind. You know, your ministry, it's not just, it's not standing up here doing what I'm doing per se. Ministry doesn't have to be in the context of church. You do ministry wherever you find yourself. So if you're really passionate about a sporting club that you're part of, there is your, you know, you do ministry there. Your workplace, your university, your family, wherever it is, your ministry is really the outworking of what God has called you to and what God has asked you to do wherever you find yourself. So you can't be effective in that ministry if you are spiritually blind. And Peter, you see, he wanted the Christians of this time and the Christians even of today to be effective in ministry. And someone else who wants us to be effective in ministry is Jesus. He wants us to be effective in ministry. But you know what? I think I'd find it hard to find anyone in here that didn't want to be effective in their ministry because ultimately, don't we all want to live a life that matters? A life that leaves a legacy, a life that where things stick, where things will last past our time on this earth. 
If we don't have these qualities increasing in our life, if our faith isn't flourishing like Peter talks about, what he's saying is that we become nearsighted, we become blind, and we actually forget that we were cleansed from our former sins. We essentially get spiritual amnesia, right? It's like amnesia. We're forgetting the past. Now, if you think about it, physically speaking, when we're nearsighted, we can see maybe our hand that's in front of us, but we can't really see too far past that. It gets a bit blurry past that point. Well, spiritually speaking, if things are blurry past that point, it's really hard to see into the future. It's really hard to see where God is leading you and give you direction. It's really hard to avoid the obstacles in your way. And it's, it's really hard to have hope for the future when it's blurry in the distance. You might be able to see your hand in front of you, but what that ends up doing often is it actually makes people who are nearsighted quite selfish and self-focused because they can't really see past themselves. When you are blind, you can't see anything, right? So chances are you're going to trip over the obstacles in your way and you're going to have no awareness of your surroundings around you. And so when you're spiritually blind, if you've got no awareness of your surroundings around you, you're not aware of what God is doing. You're not aware of the obstacles the enemy may put in your way. And then amnesia, I actually find this really interesting because if, if you, in the physical sense, were to have amnesia and you weren't able to remember your past, you weren't able to remember where you've come from, the experiences that have led you to the place where you are, it would be very hard to have a solid sense of identity if you don't remember where you've come from. Spiritually speaking, this is actually the same because if, you, if the enemy can cause us to forget where we've come from, to forget who we are in Christ and forget what he's done for us and his faithfulness in our life, then he can actually cause us to start to lose that sense of identity in Christ. And that's really dangerous because then we start to feel lost and then we're in a position where we can be pulled in any direction because we don't have a clear direction of where we're going. So that can be a really dangerous thing. Being spiritually blind is dangerous. We, uh, my husband and I, we were um, heading down to Inverloch a little while ago. And I tell you what, I have never seen rain so heavy as I did on that day. We were heading down. It's like it came out of nowhere. And it was just coming and coming against the windscreen and the, uh, the windscreen and the windscreen wipers, they could not keep up. It was dangerous because we could barely see the cars in front of us. If there was an obstacle on the road, we would have had no idea about it. Don't worry, we did pull over. But sometimes spiritually, this can almost happen to us where life comes at us so hard and it's like where the windscreen wipers trying to keep up and we just can't quite get there and so things become blurry things become foggy and we can't see in front of us we start running into obstacles we start um you know we there's a there's a high risk that we may actually crash into something in front of us but following jesus will keep you clear-sighted walking away makes you blind to your sin Part of the reason that being spiritually blind is so dangerous is because it makes us blind to our sin. It means that we can't actually see the weight and the significance that our sin has. Now, when I talk about sin, it's not just all, you know, the terrible things that people have done. It's actually God has a plan and intention for us. And if we are off center to that, then that's sin because we're walking in a life that's not what God has called us to. So that in itself is sin. And when we are spiritually blind and we can't see the sin in our life, it means that we actually then can't understand the weight of salvation in our lives. We believe in a God who loves us so much and wants to have relationship with us, but he's a perfect God and sin is far from perfect. So Jesus came, he lived a perfect life in our place, something we were not capable of doing. And then he took our sins upon him and he died on the cross. You see, the penalty for sin was death. And so Jesus, he died on the cross in our place. And something you have to understand about that is that his death, it was one of the most grueling, it was humiliating, painful experiences and ways that you could die. And it, the reason that it is that way is our sin, it's a big deal. He went through that for us. He went through that in our place. That should have been us, but it was him. And at, at now we get this gift where Jesus, he, he defeated the power of that. He rose again three days later. And now when God looks at us, if we've accepted salvation in our life, we've, said, we've accepted that gift and we've said, yes, Jesus, then 
we now get that perfect life that Jesus lived, that is now placed on us. We now get the gift of that, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything that Jesus did. When we are spiritually blind and we stop seeing that sin in our life, we lose the understanding of the weight of what Jesus did for us and of our salvation. And if we're not aware of the sin in our life in the past or in the present, we don't see any need to change or grow. If we don't see a need to change or grow, we're not going to become more like Jesus. We're not going to become more like Christ. In addition to this, We're not going to be able to see things the way that God does with his eyes. We're not going to be able to fully understand his word, his teaching, his doctrine. We're going to very likely be anxious about the future because we can't see a clear picture in front of us. It almost makes us morally independent of God where we kind of become God unto ourselves a bit. And when we're in this state, we can't become more like Jesus. So I have a question for you, just for you. Maybe write it down. You can reflect on it later. But... How do you feel about the sin in your life right now? Like, Are there things that you are allowing in your life currently? Things that you're allowing that maybe you don't want to bring to God, maybe you don't want to admit to, but you're allowing it in your life. Or have if, if God was to come to you right now and to say, I want you to make this change in your life, yep, it's going to cost you, but I want you to make this change. I want you to go in this direction. Could you do it? Would your faith be at a point where you are willing to compromise your comfort for that? Because a good test, whether you're spiritually blind or not, is whether we've become comfortable with our sin or whether we are now ready to step out in faith. If you block the Holy Spirit's voice in your life, it has a way of searing your conscience. So let's say there's something that you're allowing in your life and you hear that voice of the Holy Spirit, that conviction of the Holy Spirit, but you push it away and you do you do that thing anyway. What it does is we push away the Spirit and so then we sear our conscience. And then often, well, pretty much every time, not even just often, the enemy will come in and slam us with guilt. And then we start to push ourselves further away from God. Then we sear, then we hear that voice again, that conviction, and then we push it away. So then we sear our conscience and we push ourselves further away from God. Eventually, it's as though you stop hearing that conviction and that voice in your life because you become so comfortable with your sin and you've pushed yourself so far away from God. You know, for me personally, when I think of God's faithfulness, it gives me so much hope for the future. If there's decisions that I have to make or if there is a situation in front of me that is hard, I think of God's faithfulness in my life. I think of times when he's been there next to me the whole way through. I think of decisions I've made and how he's been faithful to that. And if I need to make a decision, I can do it knowing where he's called me, knowing who I am in him. And so I can have security in the decision that he's called me to make, even if it costs me. You see, we can't afford to be blind because it's honestly just a harder way to live. (laughs) Like it's way harder having no direction and we end up feeling lost and wasting a whole lot of time. When we're clear-sighted, we can avoid being misled. And I think everyone would agree to me that if if you had someone here that was blindfolded and we tried to follow them for directions, it would be useless. When it comes to the Christians at the time, they were following some false teachers That's essentially like following someone with a blindfold. It's useless. We need to follow with clear sight, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Seeing your salvation clearly gives you hope for the future. It keeps you close to God and it keeps you on the right track. And you know, some things, who knows that sometimes something can look one way in the physical, but then totally different in the supernatural. So I think of Peter as a good example for this, and we are going to read it. This is an example of one of his great mistakes. He, um, we're going to look in Matthew 16, verse 21 to 23 in just a moment. But this piece of scripture, what happens, so it's come just after a real high for Peter. He's just had the moment where he's like, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And Jesus goes, my father in heaven has revealed this to you. Like what a high for Peter. He's like, I get it. Jesus and I were on the same page. Like I, I've nailed this. I'm onto it. And then pretty much straight after, Jesus is foretelling his death and resurrection. And that's where we pick it up in verse 21. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. 
You are a hindrance to me. He's gone from my father in heaven has revealed this to you to get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You know, Peter just a moment ago was setting his eyes on the things of God and all of a sudden in a moment, he's setting his eyes on the things of man. And I find it so interesting how quickly this can flip, right? But you can so see how he got there. Jesus is telling about this terrible thing that's going to happen. And Peter, being his friend and also looking up to this man, knowing that he's the saviour, is like, this can't be the case. This is not what's going to happen. Like, I'll protect you. He doesn't want this to happen. But one thing was happening in the natural. Another thing was happening in the supernatural. And then that brings us to Jesus' death on the cross. See, in the natural, it looked like Jesus had been defeated. In the natural, it looked like death had defeated Jesus. But really what was happening in the supernatural was that Jesus was mid-defeating death. It looked like the enemy won, but really Jesus was mid-defeating death and the result of the cross was that we now have victory over the enemy forever. Different things, natural, supernatural, different things are happening. So when it comes to your circumstances or maybe the circumstances of your loved ones in your life that might even be going on right now, maybe it comes to direct, when it comes to your life and direction in your life, it may look one way in the natural, but it may look another in the supernatural. So what are you not seeing yeah. right now? What are you missing right now? I do wonder how much of our worry comes from not seeing things the way that God yeah. sees them. When we see with faith what is out of our control is okay because we know that it's in God's control. And it's a really peaceful place to be. You know, um, before I go to bed at night, I try to remember to do this thing. I try to clear the way to the toilet, right? Because one too many times, you know, I don't like to turn the light on at night if I have to go to the toilet because I feel like it will wake me up. And so I, I, I take the walk in the darkness, okay? And one too many times, I have tripped over my lovely husband Zach's shoes. One too many times. He has this way of leaving them right in the pathway. So between the chest of drawers and the bed or right in front of the door of the ensuite. And I'll, you know, walk, I'm like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. It's, it's, it's cold. You finally get up. You go to the toilet. It's like, oh, trip. And I almost fall. I'm like, Zach, your shoes. Now, I should say that sometimes I do that and then I realise they're my shoes. Um, So I really, I don't complain too much because I have to admit and full honesty, I do the same thing as Zach does. But Zach, when he leaves his shoes there, you know, in the dark, I don't have an understanding of the surroundings around me. And so it's really easy to trip and fall. Spiritually speaking, if we don't have the awareness of what is around us, it's really easy to trip and fall. If you can't see what God is doing in your life right now, can I encourage you, run to the light, not away from it. By which I mean run to God, not away from him, because the light makes things clear. The light exposes things. The light, the light shows us the obstacles that are in the way. This blindness that um, we're talking about, this lack of understanding of our salvation, it actually hinders us from the ability to be able to live our life in that freedom and the fullness that God has called us to live in and that, that Jesus has bought for us. And that can cause us to fall. You know, at the time, Peter was really concerned that the church would become blind, that they would, that they would just listen to the t- false teachers and because of that, that they would fall into sin and they would fall away from God. So how do we keep ourselves from falling? Because it's the same for us today. We can be pulled in many different directions in our culture. So how do we keep ourselves from falling? You know, the qualities that Peter speaks about, they come from a position of faith. They come from a foundation of faith. And if you display them, he says, you will never fall. So how do you have those qualities? Through a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. We need to dig deep. We can either fall at the feet of Jesus or from the feet of Jesus. If we fall at his feet in regards to relationship, growing that relationship, we won't fall from them. You know, my eight-month-old son, Malachi, he is really solid on the commando crawl right now. He's very quick and... um, He just wants to be wherever the people are. So he's a very happy little man. You might see him around. He's smiling at most, you know, pretty much everyone. And he's great, right? Until everyone leaves the room and then he's not so happy anymore. So I walk into the kitchen and there is Malachi at my feet. I walk back into the lounge room. He does a little 180. 
there is Malachi at my feet. I sit down on the couch, there is Malachi at my feet. I try to do some work, there is Malachi at my feet. Wherever I go, he follows, right? He just wants to be where I am. And sometimes I think when it comes to Jesus and being at his feet, I think that we picture it as though we go and we sit at Jesus' feet and then we go and do our life and we go about our life and then we come back to him and we sit at his feet and then we go and we go about our life. But I actually think that it's a lot more similar to my son Malachi. I think that sitting at Jesus' feet is actually a lot more similar to what Malachi does because wherever Jesus goes, we should follow. To be at his feet, we follow where he goes. Why? Because we just want to be with him. We just want to be where he is. Maybe right now you feel far from God. Maybe there's mistakes that you've made in your life. Maybe you feel guilty because maybe there is a sin that you are allowing in your life right now. And maybe you can't see where God is taking you. But the enemy would want to make you believe that you can't find your way back to Jesus' feet. He would want you to think that once you've fallen away, there's no coming back. But that is simply not true. You see, Jesus, he is always there with arms open wide, waiting to welcome you home. You know, when it, um, the, my, one of my favourite things about um, the iPhone is Siri, right? I'm sorry if I set off anyone's series right now. But one of the things that I love about Siri is I can tell Siri to remind me of things. Siri has become like my personal assistant. And, you know, my brain has always needed reminders. And then I became a mum of a baby and now it needs even more reminders. And so I will tell Siri like, hey, Siri, remind me to do this at 9am on Tuesday morning, right? And then Siri will tell me at 9am on Tuesday morning what I needed to be reminded about. It's almost foolproof until... Siri gets it wrong and then I can't remember what I was meant to be reminded about because I can't understand the gibberish Siri's come out with and then it's worse because then I can't remember what I meant to remember I just know I meant to remember something but generally speaking it's a very helpful tool and we all need reminders in life right it's really easy to forget life comes and we're able and you know and, and we forget things really really easily you know I think Jesus knew this about us because that's why we have communion It's literally a time that he said, do this in remembrance of me. Take the time to sit, remember, do communion because you need to sit with this and remember the weight and the significance of what I've done for you on the cross so that you can keep it active in your life. So I think Jesus knew this about us. We lose sight of the significance and the weight of the gospel so easily and the teaching that has been taught. And things really quickly can become old news. Our culture, it moves so fast. Think of fashion trends, right? Like loose, loose jeans, tight jeans, high rise, mid rise. Like even just, just, even just jeans, women's or men's, fashion trends, they change so quickly. Maybe social media trends, they change quickly. I was watching a TV show the other day and um, the kid mentioned MySpace to their dad. Like their dad was just so out of date and MySpace was gonna, the coolest thing was gonna last forever. Some of you here won't remember MySpace. Some of you here will be like, I was a top friend. And other people are like, that's really old, what are you talking about? But fashion, like social media trends even change. Uh, music trends change, language changes. I, when I go to youth, I don't understand most of what is said and I need an education on the language of Gen Z. But Peter was afraid that it wouldn't just, what the teaching wouldn't just become old news, but that they would be so careless with it that they would just forget about it completely. You see, they thought they were pretty stable. You know, the Christians at the time, they had the teaching. They, they knew Jesus. So they may have thought that they were pretty stable in their faith. But Peter wasn't so convinced. He knew they needed the reminder. They needed that to keep them in the right direction so they wouldn't be left as, led astray. Because if you're unstable, you go wherever the wind blows. And if they weren't so stable and they lived in the time so close to Jesus, like when Peter was writing to them... If they weren't that stable, then who are we to think that we would be any more stable, right? So we need to remember, we need to stay on guard as well. Peter, he wanted to make sure the reminder was there for all time. And he knew that they did not need anything new. What They, what they didn't need him to come out with some new revelation, some new teaching. They just needed to be reminded of what had already been taught. You know, my aim today, even as a preacher, isn't to teach you really anything new. So if you come for something new, I'm sorry. You know, we're always talking about this fresh word, fresh word. 
But the freshest word you can have is one straight from the word of God because there is nothing new. What we need is a revelation and a deeper understanding of what has already been taught. And what can, I suppose there can be a tendency or we can um, be tempted sometimes to try to look for something new, a new teaching, and even to fix the, um, the tendencies of the generations previous to us. So for example, something that I have noticed even in my life is that At some stage, there was a bit of a pendulum swing towards fear of God, fear of God, fear of God. Now, what that meant was that people often were like, you've got to do X, Y, Z, and all the kind of religion-based thinking, right? It's all about what you do. You do X, Y, Z, and then, you know, you're sweet. You're a good Christian, right? Then we had this pendulum swing that came all the way the other way, and it goes, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's about grace. It's about love. Now, God is love, okay? We cannot separate God from love. Love absolutely is so, so important and his grace is enough for us. But I remember times in youth when I would have friends that would be making mistakes and allowing sin in their life because they're like, Jesus died for it anyway. I've got grace in my life and it made grace cheap, right? On the other end, we're not supposed to be afraid of God and we don't do things because we, you know, we don't do, we do things out of the love for God, right, out of our relationship with him. So we are supposed to have a healthy fear, reverence, awe for God, not to be afraid of him like, ah, scared, but healthy awe and reverence for God. We're supposed to respect his bigness and who he is in our lives. But also we are supposed to, at the same time, understand that he loves us and there is grace. So it's not either or, it's both and in that. I've also noticed it um, even with this idea of kind of performance-based church. So there's been a lot of talk about, you know, it's all about performance, it's all about what it looks like, what it looks like. Now, this has really come out of people wanting to do something in excellence to God. And there is nothing wrong with wanting to do things in excellence to God. We should always do our best for God, give him our first fruits. We should always do things in excellence for God. On the other side to that, there's then, well, then we lose, you know, but what if we lose his presence because we're all about performance. So presence, presence, presence. Now our theme this year is a church's presence and I think it is a great theme, okay? We, if we don't have the presence of God, what are we doing? It is so, so important that we have the presence of God. But having the presence of God doesn't mean that we need to throw out the lights, It doesn't mean that we don't do things in excellence to God. It doesn't mean that we have to go out to a paddock somewhere for something to be authentic, right? We have the presence of God, but we can still do things in excellence to him. And so sometimes what we can do is we can swing the pendulum so far the other way, trying to fix the mistakes of the previous generation, when really we just need to find the balance and come back to what has already been taught. You know, when we come to salvation, we come to know the truth. Then... We are established in it and then we are reminded of it. See, Peter's hope was that they would end their life with a deeper relationship and greater hope in Jesus than when they first believed. And it's the same for us. You know, our hope should be that we would end our lives in a deeper relationship with Jesus and greater hope in Jesus than when we first believed in him. Peter speaks about these riches in verse 11. And in small group recently, we've been doing this um, series by Luke Igliero. He has many great things to say. But one of the things that stuck with me was um, this language, so that versus because. So for example, you know, I serve at church so that people will love me or people will praise me, right? It's not so that, it's actually because. I serve at church because I have transformed by Jesus because I love Jesus, because I want to grow in the gifts that Jesus has put in my life, because I want to bless others because Jesus has blessed me. So it's this language that's not so that, it's because. And when it comes to riches in heaven, our motive is never so that we can get riches. It's because of our transformed heart. See, good works is never going to get you to heaven. You can't work your way to Jesus. It's the evidence. Those good works are the evidence of your salvation. It always comes back to the heart. So we're going to keep reading in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 to 15. So in verse 12 it says, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as the Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you will be able at any time to recall 
these things. I'm going to get my bottle uh, over there. In my bottle, I have some water and I have some sand. Okay, now I want you to imagine that the water represents God and the sand represents us. Okay, right now, the sand is pretty settled. It's really, it's pretty separate from the water. But if I stir it up, what happens? If I stir it up, it's as though it becomes one. If I was to try to separate the sand from the water right now, it would be really, really hard. Okay, but if I stop stirring and I let it settle, what happens? The sand starts to sink back down to the bottom. This is kind of what our relationship with God is like. This is what our faith is like. If we are stirring, it's like we are one with him. It's really hard to even separate our thoughts, our actions, what we do from him. But as we allow the sand, as we allow ourselves to settle, we stop stirring ourselves up in faith and being stirred up. What happens is that we start to almost separate ourselves from God. Now, we know that we can never separate ourselves from the love of God because, the, the you know, we, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We know that. But to, God has his part and he is always there and ready. We have our part and sometimes what we do is we start to drift. We start to fall away and distance ourselves from God. If we stop stirring we become, in a sense, separated. We distance ourselves from him. We live apart from him. And Peter's saying, remember how good God is. Remember this teaching and that will stir your faith. So church, be stirred up. We can be stirred up for many things. We can be stirred up for something that God has asked you to do. We can be stirred up for people in our life. We can be stirred up to have deeper relationship with Him. We can be stirred up for worship, for more of His presence. There are all these amazing things that we can be stirred up in. You know, the word stir that He uses here in the Scripture, it's actually translated to awaken or stimulate. To awaken or stimulate something there has to already be something there to awaken or stimulate, right? So first you need salvation. You need to have that there to be able to stir your faith. And when we do stir it, we awaken and we stimulate that. This is what the reminder does. It awakens, it stimulates. So, you know, I, I love in verse 12, 13 and 15, Peter mentions words about reminders. So 12, remind you of these qualities. Uh, verse 8, way of reminder. Uh, verse 15, at any time to recall these things. He really wanted to make sure the reminder was there for all time. So do you take time to reflect? Do you take time to remember? What does it actually look like for you in your life? Maybe it's time praying and reading the Word. Um, time in worship. You know, that's great because what it does is it reminds you of God and His goodness and then it stirs you to do more of that and then it reminds you and then it stirs you and it, through that you gain a deeper relationship with God. It's so important that we structure our lives in a way where we're constantly being reminded so that we can be stirred up because that stirring up comes from the reminder. Peter's call was to strengthen and to establish the church, to establish people, to stir them up in their faith. And it's the same for us. We do that with each other. So one of the best things you can do to structure your life in a way to be stirred up is to be in church, is to be in small group, is to be around a community that's going to support you, encourage you, remind you and stir you up. You know, for me personally, my faith is so stirred when I see God move. But really like when I see God move in other people's lives and I see him move in my own life it's stirred but when I see him move in other people's life when I see other people step up and step into what he's called for them to do that stirs my faith like nothing nothing else you know if you picture someone right now stirred up in their faith even just close your eyes picture someone who's stirred up what does that look like now do you see yourself in that how big is the gap between the person that you see and what that looks like and where you are right now? Because being stirred up looks like something. You know, we can almost play spot the difference Christian, right? You've got the one version, maybe you want to play spot the difference with yourself and the stirred up version of you and maybe not. But when we play spot the difference Christian, the person who's stirred up, 
They want others to experience what they have, so they evangelize. They share Jesus with people because they want others to know the freedom that they have found in Jesus. They pray, they're full of energy to step out, to step up, to do what God has called them to do, to hear from God. They carry this excitement about God and what He's doing in their life. They're full of faith. They're passionate. They're walking in step with the Holy Spirit. They're honouring, they're grateful. You can see it. They have these qualities that Peter talks about. You can see when someone is stirred up in their faith. And a mature Christian, they're not necessarily uh, content with how stirred up they are. They're always stirred up, don't get me wrong. But it's like they are content in God, but not complacent with where they are. Because we always know that we can become more like Jesus. And so we are all on this journey to becoming more and more like Jesus. But let's not ever become complacent. Let's remember to be stirred up each and every day. A Christian who's stirred up falls more in love with Jesus every day. So let's finish our life with a deeper relationship with Jesus, with a greater hope in Jesus than when we first met Him. I want to take a moment um, to pray um, for anyone who hasn't made the decision to follow Jesus. Now, after this, we're going to pray for those here who maybe you feel distant right now. Maybe you're unable to see what God is doing in your life right now. Um, maybe, you know, maybe the enemy is convincing you that, it, that you can't come back to him um, and you feel like you've fallen away from him. We're going to take a moment to do that. Um, but first, I want to pray for anyone in this place who hasn't yet made the decision to follow Jesus. And, you know, I've been talking about this this God who gives us direction in our life, who gives us a peace in our life. You know, if you're going through life right now and you don't believe in Jesus, then what Peter would say is that you're, you're blind to what's going on around you. And there is this peace that comes with knowing Jesus and knowing where He's called you, that comes with having that faith through life, faith for a world that is beyond what this one looks like. And so I want to give you right now the opportunity to say yes to Jesus. So with every eye closed, just to give people privacy, if that's you here today and you have never made that decision, I just want you to raise your hand in the air right now so that I know who I'm praying for. And then we'll pray all together. So if there is anyone right here, awesome. If there's anyone else that um, that has never made that decision to follow Jesus, it's the best decision you will ever make in your life. I want you just to raise your hand right now and then we're going to pray together. Amazing. Praise God. We're going to pray together. Why don't you repeat after me? Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I choose to follow you every day for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. Awesome. That is the best decision you will ever, ever make. Um, right now, we're going to take uh, just, just a chance to be able to pray into what we've been speaking about today. And if you are here today and you feel like maybe your faith has become a bit complacent, maybe you need to be stirred up afresh Maybe there's something that you're actually allowing in your life right now that isn't meant to be there and you want to say, God, I'm taking this seriously. I'm going to get everyone to stand right now. Um, And if that's you, maybe your heart is stirred in this moment to respond. I'm going to ask you in a moment with everyone's eyes closed to put your hand up because I really believe that sometimes when it comes to faith, we actually physically need to step out and do something to partner with the decision that we're making. It's one thing to say it in our head. It's another thing to physically respond and say, Jesus, like I'm, I'm actually, I'm stepping out for you right now. So with every eye closed, if that's you here today and you feel like this message has spoken to you and you want to be stirred up in your faith, why don't you raise your hand right now and we're going to pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you are always with us. God, that you are always for us. And Father, right now I pray for the people who have their hand raised. And God, I pray that you would just come and meet them where they're at. God, for people who may have been allowing things in their life, Lord, I pray you would cut that off. God, I pray for people who maybe even be feeling guilt about where they're at right now. God, I pray that you would just fill them with your peace and your love. Lord, I pray that any of the lies that may be fed to them, Lord, that you would bring in your truth. And God, that you would give these people such a deep revelation, Father, of what has already been taught of your gospel, of your goodness, of your grace in our lives, of your mercy. And Father, I pray that where there was blindness, God, I pray you would help them to see. Would you speak to them so clearly? 
God, would you speak to them so clearly? Would you restore their memory, God, of your faithfulness? And God, I pray that they would be stirred up in faith each and every day, falling more and more in love with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.